and good morning. My name is Leisha and welcome to ND Church 1130 English Worship. Today is the last of the apologetic series entitled Irrational Faith. Why apologetic? So by now you would have you have been tuning on to this series, you'll know that apologetic comes from the Greek word and it means speaking in defense. What are we talking about here? We're talking about a series of questions defending the Christian belief. So recap of what we have covered so far. Has suffering disproved God? We heard from Bainsey right from the beginning, reminding us suffering isn't always bad. Suffering, in fact, is necessary part of understanding God's story. The one who suffered, he is also very familiar with pain. He suffered so that we don't have to. He suffered so we are healed for our pain and so that we would know of his great love for us. Week two, is the Bible just made up? Doug took us through how the Bible tells us one big story. All parts fit into one coherent storyline. Each writer has a role, all working together for the same ultimate purpose. The Bible has Christ in the center, all of God's work in the world. Week three, do you need God to be good? Bensi helped us look at the fundamentals of being good. Kindness to one another doesn't make sense without God. The Christian story assigns the foundation for morality. Week four, what about the dinosaurs? We heard whilst the Bible may not talk about dinosaurs, it also does not not talk about dinosaurs. God made everything. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. Focus on the creator, not what was created. God restores good and order, and he showers us his blessing despite sin and rebellion. Redeemed through his son, Jesus, God made everything and in control forever and forevermore. What about the Aztecs? Last week, we also talked about um, what about those who have not heard the gospel? God didn't choose Israel because of what they have done. God chose them despite their rebellion. Not by works we are saved, but by grace. Name of Jesus alone can be saved. The big question then is what would you do with the gospel that you have now heard? Today, our final question on this series is, is God anti-gay? We've been using an online platform called Slido, and it's so good to engage with you at home and for our speaker to also answer your questions. This week, we will do the same. It is now live, and if you want to click onto the link or the QR code, please do put in your questions. Give it a go. Uh, if you want to remain anonymous, you can do so, and you can also vote on someone else's question. Our aim for church service is to be interactive, so please do send in your questions, and we will address them at the end of service. So whether you've been worshipping with us online or you've just started, regardless, we want to say welcome. For many of us, being in lockdown and on screen day and night can be extremely exhausting. It is not easy and life was never meant to be easy. In times like these, you just want to cry out for help. Remember, we're not left alone and without help. The Bible centers on the crucified, risen and reigning Christ. He is the one that is full of promises for every crisis. The history of God's church is full of empowering examples of those who prove that the grace of God is sufficient to enable us to endure to the end and be saved. The Bible tells us one mega story of what he is like. He, it represents God's dealing with the world and with man. That's why as a church, we read it together as we encourage one another from the scriptures. Psalm 90 says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations, before the mountains were born, or you brought the form, the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning, it springs up new, and by evening, it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sin in the light of your presence. 
all our days pass away under your rock. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing of joy. Be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yet, yes, establish the work of our hands. Amen. Next is the praise and worship. We will follow the order of service in our e-bulletin. If you'd like a copy, please let us know. Let us start today's service by singing praises to our great God. And I'll hand it over to Dan and Jen. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Daniel and this is Jen. So as many of you may have know or may have heard, we have a toddler called Fier. So he's always got a bruise or a graze somewhere because he's always tripping over or falling off something, uh, no matter how many times we tell him to watch where he's going. Uh, uh, but I wasn't any different. As a preschooler, I didn't listen to my parents either. And I once ran headfirst into a concrete pillar and I knocked myself out. So since creation, um, um, all of us have always thought that we know what's best for ourselves. Uh, better than our parents, better than our teachers or the government, um, and, and better than the God who created us. Um, this morning's topic is a difficult one, one in which may, we may not agree with the culture around us. Um, so as we start, let's adopt an attitude of humility and prepare our hearts to hear what God has to say to us. <laughs> to the dust and you breathed life into us in your image we were made to live you gave us the world even more you gave us yourself in your likeness we Oh 
for reading the Bible again for us this week. Hello. Last week you mentioned that you found uni really stressful. And what have you found most challenging about the transition from high school to uni? Yeah, um, I think the hardest would just be adjusting to the workload because back then uh, the same amount of content would have been spread over a term or two, whereas now it's just crammed into 13 weeks. Mm, yeah, it is pretty stressful, hey, and then without the kind of same structures that you have at school as well. What about joy? What have you found most joyous? Um, I guess just being able to choose uh, classes that you're actually interested in. Mm, that's true. Finally, now that we know that we're at the end of this uh, Rational Faith series, what have you found most helpful in this series? Um, I guess just remembering to have an open mind while reading the Bible and focus on the key messages and how we can apply those in our daily lives. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Um, thank you again for reading the Bible for us. I'll leave you to that. Oh, good. So today's Old Testament Bible reading comes from 1 Kings chapter 4. So King Solomon ruled over all Israel. And these were his chief officials, Azariah, son of Zadok, the priest, Elihoreph and Ahijah, sons of Shisha, secretaries, Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilad, recorder, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, commander-in-chief, Zadok and Abitha, priests, Azariah, son of Nathan, in charge of the district governors, Zabad, son of Nathan, a priest and advisor to the king. Ahisha, palace administrator, Adoniram, son of Abda, in charge of forced labor. Solomon had 12 district governors all over all Israel who supplied provisions for the king and the royal household. Each one had to provide supplies for one month in the year. These are their names. Ben-Hur, in the hill country of Ephraim, ben Deca in Mechaz, Shalbim, Beth Shemesh, and Elon Bethanan, Ben Hazard in Araboth, Soko and all the land of Hepha were his. Ben Abinadab in Napathdor, he was married to Tapath, the daughter of Solomon. Bana, son of the Hilad, in Tanakh and Megiddo, and in all of Bethshan next to Zarathan, below Jezreel, from Bethshan to Abel Mahola, across to Jogmim. Ben Geba, in Ramoth Gilead, the settlements of Jer, son of Manasseh, in Gilead were his, as well as the region of Argob in Bashan, and its 60 large walled cities with bronze gate bars. Ahinadab, son of Ido, in Mahaniam. Ahimaz, in Naphtali. He had married Basemath, daughter of Solomon. Bana, son of Hushai, in Asher and in Allah. Jehoshaphat, son of Pharaoh, in Isashah. Shimei, son of Elah, in Benjamin. Geba, son of Uri, in Gilead. The country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and the country of Og, king of Bashan. He was the only governor over the district. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as a sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, and they were happy. And Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines, as far as the border of Egypt. These countries brought tribute and were Solomon's subjects all his life. Solomon's daily provisions were thirsty, were 30 cores of the finest flour and 60 cores of meal, 10 head of store-fed cattle, 20 of pasture-fed cattle, and 100 sheep and goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowl. 
for he ruled over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates River, from Tifsa to Gaza, and had peace on all sides. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Bathsheba, lived in safety, everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for chariot horses and 12,000 horses. The district governors, each in his month, supplied provisions for King Solomon and all who came to the king's table. They saw to it that nothing was lacking. They also brought to the proper place their quotas of barley and straw for the chariot horses and the other horses. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezrahite, wiser than Helan, Kalko and Dada, the sons of Mahal, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life, from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ernst, uh, and I'm part of the mission ministry team here at ND. Um, today, I'll be sharing with you guys our missionaries of the month, uh, Richard and Grace Ding, um, so that you can better support them in prayer. So a little bit about Richard and Grace. Um, so they moved to Sydney in 1994. Uh, they have two children, uh, one of which um, attended ND um, and has moved to another church, and one of them still attends ND. And they have two grandchildren. Um, and Richard was working as a pastor here in Sydney uh, for many years, um, while Grace was a uni university lecturer during this time. Now, in 2015, they started full-time mission work uh, in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Um, so with Phnom Penh, almost half of its population is actually under 25 years old. So Cambodia is actually one of the fastest growing populations in the region. With 93% of their 17 million people believing in Buddhism um, and about 2% of the population being Christian, you can see that there is a great gospel need there. So Richard and Grace have also noticed that there is an even greater need for the gospel to the people outside capital cities, such as Phnom Penh, uh, due to the low number of Christians in the country. Uh, with Cambodia recently coming out of a terrible civil war, uh, the younger population views their lives very differently. Uh, I, I, idolizing materialism, uh, they hardly understand the true meaning of life, uh, which is a great way for missionaries like Richard and Grace to share the gospel with them. I um, mean, they're very thankful for the opportunity to do so. Um, in 2019, um, unfortunately, Richard was diagnosed with colon cancer uh, when they returned uh, back to Sydney from, from Cambodia for a holiday during a medical checkup. Uh, however, they're very thankful for the medical team that cared for Richard uh, and the road to recovery uh, that God has blessed him with. Um, fortunately, there's no further treatment required uh, except for regular blood tests and checkups. So praise God for that. Um, and due to the wonderful recovery God has blessed Richard with, uh, they plan to return to Cambodia as soon as possible. And then COVID-19 hit and the closure of international borders um, they have been unable to return to Cambodia. So at this moment, they plan to hopefully return to their mission field, possibly early next year, if all goes to plan. However, their time in Sydney has seen them serve the church in Sydney um, and Cambodians as well. Uh, so they have been serving full time at a church in Sydney for the last seven months in 2020 and, and have been working with Global Mission this year. So Global Mission is a Cambodian mission organization that they have partnered with 
uh, so that they can provide online training courses to the young people of Cambodia. So these courses include construction training um, as well as life development courses. And the goal of these training programs is to assist them in um, building their career in construction um, as well as um, an opportunity for Richard and Grace to share the gospel with these young people. So how can you be praying for uh, Richard and Grace this month? Uh, so pray for the online training course. Uh, pray for the staff in Cambodia, especially who were recently affected by COVID close contacts. contacts. Uh, pray that this will not disrupt the course too much um, and that they can continue to train the young Cambodian adults and share the gospel in this way. Um, pray for the applications to leave Australia and, ent and entry visas into Cambodia early next year. Um, and yet after being back in Sydney for two years, I pray that Richard and Grace can settle, settle well once back in Cambodia, um, pray for the restart of their education centre and all the paperwork and administration um, approvals that, that's required and that that will all go smoothly. Um, so I'll see you guys for Mission Fortnite starting from next week. Thank you. Thanks for that, Ernest. We'll now be spending some time praying together as a congregation. Prayer is a privilege, part of a Christian's life. It's how we talk to God. Prayer is a friendship with God, a friendship that is not formal, but it is also not formless. It is the way we admit our need and adopt humility before God. If you open your e-bulletin, we'll see what we'll be praying for today. So join me as we pray to God. We praise you, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with everything we need for life. We pray that we will take our spiritual life seriously and be committed to spending time in solitude. Help us to develop attentiveness to your voice in us, to come to know the spirit that you have already given to us. The pains and struggles that we encounter in our solitude then becomes a way of hope because our hope is not based on something that will happen after sufferings are over, but on the real presence of God's healing spirit in the midst of these sufferings. Help us to taste the beginnings of the joy and peace which belong to the new heaven and new earth. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those who, to whom it has been given. We ask, Lord, that we may trust the word of God regarding faithfulness is our sexual behavior. We continue to pray for the people of Afghanistan, particularly the Christians who live in danger and face the temptation to abandon Christ. We pray that, Lord, you will sustain them and give um, proper to these faithful remnants. We give thanks for peace and security that we have in Christ despite these troubled times. We pray for the government and the health authorities in the difficult and conflicting task of seeking to protect people from COVID, to care for them and to uphold people's livelihoods and well-being. We ask, Lord, that you would give those in authority wisdom and insight, patience and kindness to those, particularly those that are making decisions that will affect us all. We pray for those in the hospital, pray for those in critical condition, we pray for those who have lost their jobs, we pray for those who are feeling lonely at this time. Lord, we pray that we as a community will display Christ's love to reach out as a community to show grace and love. We pray that we will be thankful for the many things that you, in your grace, have already provided us. We pray for those. We also pray through, um, we thank, we're so thankful for the Rational Faith series, that we may be rooted in what we believe, that we are strengthened with power through your spirit, so Christ may dwell deeply in our hearts through faith. We pray for the EGM today. We pray that um, as we decide to bring on a new children's pastor, we pray that, uh, yeah, your spirit will give us guidance. Lord, we pray um, for our partners and ministry of reconciliation, both abroad and locally. We pray for continued perseverance and boldness. We pray that um, during this time, you would use the uncertainties and the hardships to draw us to you. We pray particularly for Richard and Grace Ding for their online training course in Cambodia. 
particularly to the young adults. We pray that as they learn about construction, that they will also understand the meaning of life through these courses. We pray for the staff in Cambodia, as there have been some COVID infections. Um, Lord, we pray that um, the infections will be reduced and that uh, the teaching progress and quality will not be affected. Finally, Lord, we pray for the sermon that we're about to hear. We pray for Bainsey, that he will be able to speak faithfully from your word. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. How good it is to be able to read God's word together. Doreen will continue to read for us today and then followed by Bainsey that will then help explain the word to us. Thanks. Okay. So today's New Testament Bible reading comes from Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 to 12. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is a situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, everyone. I don't normally start this way, but I think I need to give a heads up to any parents of young children who are watching uh, that you might want to consider whether they should be listening in on this topic. Uh, I'm not going to be graphic in any way, but if you've got intelligent, attentive children, some of the terminology I use you might find difficult to explain. Anyway, it's up to you. Something you might not know about me is that I studied ballet from the age of six into my early 20s. According to my mum, I came home from school one day and said, I want to dance. And she interpreted that as classical ballet for some reason. And at the age of six, I didn't have the discernment to recognise if this was what I wanted to do. Uh, and I didn't have the tools to argue with her anyway. So I did ballet from my childhood and my adolescence. Uh, and um, in the 1980s, this meant that there was a high likelihood that you were gay. Uh, it's not a stereotype, it's just a hard fact that most men who did ballet in the 80s were gay. So from the age of six onwards, and increasingly so, I was teased and bullied and derided for being gay. I was vilified for being gay long before I even knew what that meant, let alone that it didn't apply to me. I am not and never have been gay. And it wasn't just the kids at school, but Mine was a male, macho, Anglo-Australian family, and I was mocked and looked at with concern and discomfort by the men in my family. To compound matters, I inherited my uh, from my mother a love of musical theatre. So all through my teens, I was involved in theatre, which brought me into contact with gay men. I never felt uncomfortable around them. I never felt anything but comradeship as we worked to produce art together and when these gay men would flirt playfully with me I never felt anything but flattered but not interested. All of this is to establish that my position on the topic of the Bible and homosexuality 
doesn't come from a place of fear or prejudice. I spent my own teenage years hiding my interests and inclinations from the world, afraid of discovery and, and exposure. So I feel too much compassion and empathy for those who are same-sex attracted to be hostile in my heart. The issue of the Christian faith and homosexuality has become a hot button topic in the last 20 years. For many, it has become the reason to reject Christianity. For many Christians, it has become the doctrine that they're most unwilling or unable to give an answer for. So it's important that we get this right. And that means we need to approach the question very carefully. Is God anti-gay? Well, what do we mean by that question? If you're asking the question, you might be asking, do you, O oh Christian, claim that God hates gay people? Is God fundamentally opposed to LGBT plus people? Their essential existence is an affront to him. And it'll depend on whether you believe in God or not, whether you are asking if the creator himself holds this position or whether I hold it. Because if you don't believe in God, then whatever I'm about to say to, about him is just my opinion. Or you might be asking, does the Bible prohibit sexual homosexual behaviour and or view same-sex attraction as a disordered desire? which depending on how you understand sexual orientation could lead you straight back to option one. Does God hate LGBT plus people? Or is there another way of understanding this? Now, there might be more nuanced ways of seeing the question, but I have to limit myself in some way for a 30 minute talk. So I'm going to focus on these two interpretations of the question and answer these questions. But there are at least three factors which are going to impact how you hear my answer to the question. The first is what the Bible actually says. And then there's what you believe about the Bible, whether you think it is the word of God, whether you think it contains the word of God, or whether you think it's not the word of God. And that's going to affect how you hear my answer. Finally, there's what you already believe about being gay. Now, I have little to no control over the latter two. My role is to teach the Bible. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to try to teach what the Bible says about God and being gay. And then to help you think it through, I'll spell out a few of the implications you might draw, depending on what your presuppositions are. Does God hate LGBT plus people? Is he just against them as people? Are LGBT plus people just a category of human life that God stands opposed to and that God's people ought to stand opposed to? I can answer this with a flat and categorical no. God does not hate LGBT plus people or people in any category or any identity. I could point to the many passages of scripture which point to how universal and all-encompassing God's love is for the people in his creation or, or how he doesn't make a distinction based on behavior or self-identification or, or anything else. But I can get even more specific regarding same-sex attracted people by pointing us to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immor immoral, nor idolaters, nor uh, uh, adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Now, there's one phrase there that unlocks incredible insight into the church in Corinth in the first century. Men who have sex with other men are specifically mentioned, and that is what some of you were. So there were people in the church in Corinth who identified as homosexual, 
who'd been subject to homosexual desires and even acted on those desires and were nevertheless members of the church. And Paul goes on to describe them as recipients of the grace of Jesus Christ. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. These same sex attracted people were full recipients of the grace that came at the cost of Jesus' blood, which he spilled out of his love for those he was saving. There were people who, having identified as homosexual, acted on those desires, who were loved by Jesus enough for him to die for them. Does God hate LGBT plus people? No. No way. Absolutely not. This is incredibly important for us to recognise because, sadly, Christians have a history of vilifying people who are LGBT+. The scriptures give no justification to revile or shun or turn away LGBT people any more than it does anyone else who comes earnestly seeking to know the Lord. Does God hate LGBT plus people? By no means. But that's not to say that there is no God-given order to human sexuality. It doesn't mean that there's no rules and that people are free to decide individually or to fluctuate with the prevailing social norms. When your children tells lies or, or disobeys or squabble, you, you say, say that you still love them, but, and that doesn't give permission for them to then continue lying or disobeying or squabbling. Love does not cancel out God's standards. The Bible does present a clear and precise sexual ethic. In that passage we, we just looked at from Corinthians, Homosexual practices are listed with other behaviours, including certain heterosexual practices, which are classified as wrongdoing. They're illicit. They're against God's standards for sexual behaviour. The Bible presents a clear purpose for sexual behaviour and the conditions under which it is to take place. And we're going to look at that now. And for this, can I ask you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 19, to that passage we heard read out earlier. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now, in this passage, Jesus is answering a question about divorce, not about homosexuality. And, and some people might try to argue that it therefore has nothing to do with, with whether homosexual practice is sinful or not, but that is to misunderstand divorce. Divorce is about the legal recognition of someone ceasing to be sexually committed to one person in order to be free to be sexually committed to another. If you're in a marriage, you're legally recognised as being sexually committed to one person. And if you're going to be legally sexually committed to someone else, then first of all, you have to get a divorce because otherwise it's bigamy and our law doesn't recognise that. Now, there's more to marriage and divorce than that, but that's at least a substantial part of why we have marriage as an institution and why we have divorce. Now, you can be promiscuous whether you're married or divorced, legally speaking, but if you're going to be committed to just one person, you, you first have to uncommit yourself from anyone else that you've been legally committed to. So this is at least to a substantial degree talking about sex. And we see evidence of that in Jesus' response. Because Jesus answers by affirming that sex is to take place in a lifelong, exclusive, heterosexual marriage. Verse 4, haven't you read, he replies. Jesus begins by asking, haven't you read the Bible? Don't you know what it says? He's affirming what scripture has already laid out from the beginning. This is sometimes misused by those who argue that Jesus never said anything about homosexuality and therefore he must have been at least ambivalent on the subject. If it mattered, he would have said something. You might be holding a Bible 
in which the words Jesus spoke are highlighted in red. Uh, it's called a red letter Bible. Now, I don't like red letter Bibles. I own quite a few of them, but I don't like them because they give the impression that only the word actually what matters when in truth the whole of scripture is the word of God. In any case, it doesn't matter because here Jesus quotes and affirms the biblical picture of marriage that in the beginning the creator made them male and female and said for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. He's taking what was laid out in Genesis chapter two, and he is affirming it. Male and female, he made them not free to find their unique expression, not random or diverse, but specific for a purpose. Male and female, he made them two complementary parts in God's purpose for humans to fill and subdue the earth. Whatever else we might do with our creativity and our identity, our purpose is first and foremost what God has given us to fill and subdue the earth, and he's given marriage to humans to support that. It was not good for the man to be alone. He's never going to fill and subdue the earth by himself. So a partner was found, and the two were united to become one flesh. And sex supports the institution of marriage by joining, bonding the man and the woman, husband and wife, in pleasurable intimacy, which produces children in the normal course of events. Our modern age says that sex is all about pleasure. You have a desire and you find a way to satisfy. And really, that's all they've got. If you ask the average punter on the streets what sex is for, they'd say fun and love, but that's optional. The love, that is, not the sex. You don't have to love someone to have sex with them, but if you do love someone, you have to be having sex with them. It's just weird otherwise. But that's how the world thinks. That's not God's plan for sex. God's plan for sex is for the marriage of the man and the woman. Sex makes the marriage a nice place to be. We see that in the delight of leaving mother and father to be joined with this new person. Adam sings a song to Eve. He's so excited to be with her. And that makes the marriage a nice place to be. And then again, sex is incredibly intimate. And that shared intimate experience bonds the husband and wife together. My oldest and closest friend and I have been through a lot together. Uh, we began as, as members of the choir in an all-boys school. I was really doing everything I could to get teased and bullied, wasn't I? And my friend and I stood up to the bullies together. My friend and I, I, I knocked him out twice on the rugby field, uh, even though he was on my team. Uh, he doesn't remember much about that. And then when we were in year 11, my friend and I grieved together as one of our mates was killed in a car accident. I'm incredibly close to my friend. We've been through a lot together. But I'm still not as close to him as I am with my wife. I've known him a lot longer than her, but she and I are still closer. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. And the most important element of this one fleshedness is the children who come into a marriage who are quite literally the one flesh of their parents and who represent humanity's fulfilling God's command to fill and subdue the earth. And that's God's plan for sex. And so all other uses of sex are outside of God's plan. Homosexual sex doesn't fit in that purpose. 
but neither does heterosexual sex outside of the marriage promiscuity and infidelity they don't fit with god's plan for sex neither does self-indulgent fantasization not to mention the more recognizable evils of non-consensual sex pedophilia and and other abhorrent practices anything that doesn't fit within the lifelong faithful heterosexual marriage is not what god designed sex for which brings us to your underlying assumptions that's what the bible says but what are you going to make of it? Can someone be gay and a Christian? What you conclude about this depends on what you believe about the Bible, what you believe about being gay, and what you think it means to follow Christ. If you don't believe the Bible is the authoritative word of God, then you're free to just ignore it or even revile it. You might not. The majority of non-Christian societies have also affirmed that sex should be for heterosexual marriage because they look at the way men and women work together for the getting and rearing of children and they conclude that that's the way things should be. But if you don't think the Bible is God's word, then you're free to ignore the Bible. You're going to do what you want. But if that's you, you're also never going to convince those of us who do think that all scripture is God-breathed, that it's saying something it isn't. What Jesus affirms in chapter 19 as being God's purpose for marriage and therefore sex is not bound to his time and his culture. It is the transcendent purpose for all humanity in all places and at all times. So if you trust God's word, then it says what it says. And Christians who move away from that picture of God's plan for humans are doing nothing less than moving away from God's word. They're not hearers and doers of God's word, and they're not Christians. If you believe that being gay is fundamentally the identity of someone who is same-sex attracted, that, that that is who they are, and that to not act on those homosexual desires or for someone to forbid them, a person to act, not to act on those desires, if you believe that's somehow dehumanising and diminishing to a person, then you're going to see what the Bible says as holding an impossible standard for gay people. How could anyone live under such restrictions? And then you have two choices. Either you don't accept the word of God or you fall into despair. But before you do that, can I gently suggest that the commonly held view that you are who you are sexually attracted to is itself incredibly restrictive and dehumanising? It's a very strange thing to believe that a life where you do not satisfy your sexual desire is no life at all. After all, no one is ever fully satis se satisfied sexually. Even married people experience sexual frustration. Does this mean that nobody is human? That no one's life is fulfilling or worthwhile? The truth is there are a great many things more worthwhile than temporarily satiating your sexual desire. And the greatest of those things is to know and follow Jesus Christ, our Saviour. He's much more important and much more satisfying than sexual satisfaction. Now, that's not to say that for someone who is same-sex attracted, it's easy to say no to those desires and to stay celibate. It's not easy. But it's not absurd either. It's not out of the question or, or even unreasonable. It's hard, but that is the Christian life. That's what Christ asks of all of us who are called to follow him, to take up the hard option, to take up our cross, to choose perseverance through suffering and to not look back once your hand is on the plough. I honestly don't think that... More is being asked of the same-sex attracted Christian than of any Christian or every Christian. 
In fact, biblically speaking, voluntary celibacy doesn't even rate that highly on the challenges for Christians. Jesus speaks much more about the struggles of wealth for the believer than he ever speaks about sexual desires. Sexual desire, if you think about it, is only a very temporary concern. It develops during your adolescence, it peaks in your 20s and begins to taper off in your 30s. And the whole time, most of us are not out of control. We have self-control within our desires. It's much more difficult to give up the pursuit of wealth and career. And let's be honest, that's the desire. That's the desire we're mostly struggling with. That temptation to, to get rich and to win at life. That temptation is with you from the time you learn about money until the time you drop dead. Can someone who is gay be a Christian? A person, any person, gay or straight, who values their sexual desires more than they value the God who died to save them cannot be a Christian. Anyone who loves this world more than they love following Christ cannot be saved. But a same-sex attracted person who considers sexual satisfaction as not worth comparing to the eternity with their Lord that awaits them, that person can find meaning and purpose and lasting satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Let me pray that we will all do so. Our loving Heavenly Father, you've never said that following you would be easy. In fact, you said that his way, your way is hard. It is the narrow path and the narrow gate. But Lord, a treasure awaits in heaven. And so, Lord, we pray that we will choose the narrow way. We will choose to trust in you and not follow the inclinations of our hearts. But only consider the goal of eternal life with you as worthy of our pursuit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Mike, for that very um, clear and helpful message. Um, so we're going to respond with two songs. Um, so one song asking us, I'm asking God to help us to turn to him for his vision and for his wisdom. And, and this first song where we look to Christ who, who made that hardest choice um, and made that ultimate display of love for us as he uh, died on the cross and showed his love for us.
as the flood when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood today for you, Bainsley. Um, the first one is, uh, how do you reconcile this approach with Christian theologians who say that it's okay? What have they gotten wrong? How do we then justify it? Yeah, thanks for that, Lish. Uh, and thank you whoever asked that question. Uh, it is a good question. It's an important question. Um, 
in a way, I was actually heading off some of the things that um, these uh, so-called Christian theologians have said about homosexuality uh, through what I was saying about what the Bible actually does say. Um, because in my observation, those who try to justify laying aside prohibitions against homosexuality and, uh, and therefore being permissive uh, of sexual practices that the Bible says are abhorrent, and that's the word that gets used, right? Um, and abhorrent, like it's a very loaded word, but it means uh, not what God has designed things for. Um, they, they do so from a point of view, arguing that scripture is not really saying what it's saying. Uh, they try to, would try to uh, contextualise, say, oh, that's for a time and a place. Uh, there's often uh, complicated word games over what the Greek words actually translate and what the ancients understood them to translate. Um, my biggest rebuttal to that is that it doesn't get over the fact that God also lays out a specific picture of what sex is. So the Bible doesn't just give a list of things you can't do. It actually presents this is what sex is for. And if and which is what Jesus affirms in that passage we read, that this is what sex is for. This is where sex takes place. And it's the heterosexual, lifelong, uh, committed and, and faithful marriage, exclusive marriage. And logically, then, everything else just does not fit with that. So whatever the word games, and then, and I think that shows up the word games for what they are, which is a desire to try to take the mores, the, the uh, standards and values of the day, and try to shoehorn them into what scripture is saying. Um, look, I said it very frankly in, in the sermon, and I'll say it again, that if you're trying to leave behind the word of God, then you are not a hearer and doer of the word of God, which means you are not a follower of Jesus. Uh, and I think that people who are doing this are often for wonderful motivations, not selfish or evil or, or, or whatever, out of love and compassion, are nevertheless doing a great disservice to Christians uh, and to the kingdom of God by laying aside God's word and trying to follow the desires of the world. And I think that that is a, a, a really bad thing to do, he said, with masterful understatement. Our next question is, uh, what would you say then to an SSA, so a same-sex attracted person, who ask you what they should do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Um. Yeah, so uh, I have said this. I have had conversations with same-sex attractive people. I do not. Uh, the thing I will say is you need to trust in Jesus. Like That is how you are saved. If you want to inherit the kingdom of God, you put your trust in Jesus. Now, that means you put your trust in Jesus. And that means that's going to be, you're going to spend the rest of your life working out what that means. Uh, what do I need to leave behind? What is part of the old life and the old ways? that's a conversation that's going to take some time and that is going to be uh, a, a discussion we have but it's the same discussion i'd have with any follower of christ, of christ is that um, we have sexual desires those sexual desires we are called to to use for the purpose god has designed sex and that any sexual desires beyond that are not god given they're not good and, and ordered desires and so we need to leave behind the desires of our heart. And I would say that to anybody. I'd say that to a person who's um, uh, sleeping with their girlfriend, um, a boy who's sleeping with his girlfriend or a boy who's sleeping with his boyfriend. I would say that um, with love and, and encouraging them to put Christ first and to trust in him that his, his way really is better. Um, and it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing for anyone that they might not be able to have, have a satisfying sexual relationship. Um, but that applies to heterosexual people as well, to the single or the, those who, who just never find somebody. 
that is still the same command. It's not any harder on same-sex attracted people. It's not hurtful or hateful towards same-sex attracted people. Um, I think that's all I would say about that is that trust in Jesus is what I would say to somebody. Oh, cool. Um, we have another question here about what are your thoughts on conversion therapy? I'm not quite sure what. Yeah, that's going to be, <laughs> oh, that's not going to land me in trouble, is it? That's not designed. Okay. Um, is there anything I can say about that? Um, Christians believe that people can change. I mean, that's actually at the heart of, and that we don't have to be uh, slaves to our desires that actually we can be renewed because what scripture tells us that when you are in Christ, you're a new creation, that the old is gone, the new has come, and that, that the, the work of the Holy Spirit and the word of God working through you regenerates you, transforms you, and, and changes you into the likeness of Christ, not immediately, but over time, um, and, uh, and increasingly so, until the day that you're completely changed when Christ returns and you put on your holy uh, visage. Um, so, so we believe in change. Um, the degree to which a person can change, that's very complicated. Um, oh, it's dangerous territory, right? Because um, uh, it's a very loaded terminology. Conversion therapy is a, is a very loaded terminology. Um, I think that the idea of trying to uh, force anybody to change through behavior modification practices uh, is unbiblical. Uh, I think the idea of praying with somebody who wants to not follow their desires but follow Jesus and praying with that person that, that they will have those desires removed, I think that's a really good thing. Final question: um, How does God doesn't doesn't hate LGBTIQ plus people reconcile with Psalms that say God hates the wicked? Yeah, well, okay, so absolutely, God detests the wicked, but um, He also loves the wicked. He also loves and shows His mercy in the Old Testament, especially. We see this dichotomy where the wicked are the, uh, 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 those under God's judgment and his anger, righteous anger, is on those under God's judgment, which is everybody. It's very clear, eventually, is everybody. Uh, it's sometimes termed in specific instances so that we understand what what where God's judge, judgment falls and who it falls on, but ultimately it's everybody is the wicked. But also at the same time, God's love is for his creation, universal and complete. He loves every everyone. He love he is righteously angry at everyone and he is loving with everyone. And this creates a, a paradox that is very, very difficult and seemingly insurmountable. How could God be both righteously judging wickedness, but also loving those who are wicked? How can he be merciful and just at the same time? We see the reconciliation of that. We see the, the resolution of that problem in the cross of Jesus, where Jesus, where, where God judges sin, where the wicked die to sin, but are also forgiven from sin. So it's a, re it's a real misuse of scripture to say that God hates a certain class of people. Uh, because, you know, the anytime you're pointing the finger, there's three fingers pointing back at you. If you've got a wonky thumb like me, it's four. Um, there's, 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 it's a real misuse of scripture to, to use that because that's not the message. The message is ultimately that God is just and holy and he, he does care about sin. Uh, but it's, you've got to read that with all the passages that also talk about his love and compassion for people. Yeah. Thanks for that, Mainzie. That was really, really helpful. 
Now it's uh, time for our announcement. Uh, let's open up our e-bulletins and let's go down to the section entitled Announcements. Today, as I mentioned right at the beginning, is the last week of this series, uh, The Rational Faith. So I hope you've learned lots as much as I have and uh, it is our prayer that we continue to deepen our faith and love for Christ. All others' ministries remain online. Contact the relevant people in the bulletin if you'd like more information. TNT, Tuesday night trainings. It's happening next Tuesday at 8 p.m. on the 21st of September. It will be an overview of the One John series, which is after Mission Fortnite next week. EGM, the, that's happening today at 2 p.m. to appoint a new children pastor and to elect two representatives of 2022 deacon nominating committee. If you're a member, please make it a point to come early online uh, for the membership check with your name and camera on. We also want to see your little smiles. And please make sure um, you do come in early. Registration starts at 1.30. So we'll make sure we'll see you in about just under an hour. Finally, we're also preparing for the combined Thanksgiving service. We'd also um, be celebrating our belated senior minister inauguration for Reverend David Trong. Mark down 21st of November uh, at 10 a.m. Thank you for joining us. Um, this whole series has been a wonderful time to uh, reflect and really dig deep into uh, what theology, what does the Bible say about the different questions and how to defend uh, the Christian belief. So if you have any questions from today, um, an analogy that didn't make sense, please let us know. Uh, the uh, Slido is still open, so we'll still see you, see your questions come through. So please do that. Or if you have any uh, comment as well, we'd love to hear from you. If you don't normally join us, can I invite you to join us yet again, same time next week uh, at 1130. Um, we'll be starting a new, it will be on Mission Fortnite for two weeks. Join with me in prayer as we close off today's service. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you call us to be a shining light for your glory. We know that our salvation does not depend on what we do in our power, but we know that you have done everything by sending your son to die on a cross on our behalf. Thank you for Jesus who died and rose in victory bringing salvation to all who call on him for repentance in faith. Thank you that in his death and resurrection, we are made right with you. Thank you for the message of the gospel that brings life. We pray that we will humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, that he may lift us up in due time. Let us cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for us. Let us be alert and sober mind. The enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We pray that we will resist him, standing firm in the faith, because we know the family of believers throughout the work is undergoing the same kind of suffering. May God of grace, who call us to his eternal glory in Christ after we have suffered a little while, will himself restore us and make us strong, firm and steadfast. To him be power forever and ever. Amen. This concludes the formal part of today's service. Thank you for taking on this wonderful journey with me and the service team. We are so grateful for you and joyful to be participating uh, in Slido every week. Next week, as I mentioned before, it will be Mission Fortnight, where we will have a guest speaker, our very own Aaron Yap. He will be a no stranger to us, and I'm really looking forward to him. Mission Fortnight, where the theme is developing homegrown missionaries. Till then, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Well done. Well done, Leish. That, that summary at the start was just really good. Oh, like you, you took some really complicated sermons and summed them, summed them up to some 